Let us praise the name of the Lord. Let us exalt the Lamb of God today. Praise God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. It's amazing how the Holy Ghost can set the stage, set it up in, in perfection. Amen. And I thank the Lord for that. I sense and feel that today there'll be a great healing in this building. And we're excited about what God's getting ready to do. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53, I'll begin reading at verse number one. I want to say how much that we love the Mangan family and so thankful for uh, your believing in us and excited about where the church is at here and where it's headed. Amen. You have always been so kind and I thank you for it. And uh, may God bless all of you, the staff. I know you're tired. Amen. And uh, so I'll keep that in mind, but I won't promise what the Holy Ghost will do. I mean, he, he, he may move you to great excitement. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53, verse number one, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness that when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not surely surely truly he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. I uh, don't plan on sermonizing today. This church is blessed with some of the greatest preachers in Pentecost. And this past week, you've heard some of the greatest preachers in Pentecost. But I felt very strong that the Lord wants to demonstrate. So I'm believing God for a demonstration of his power and spirit here today. Amen. Praise God. Amen. My subject today is the forgotten message of Calvary. The forgotten message of Calvary. I sense your presence right now. And I would just quicken with the witness of your spirit. I believe that you've given me a sure word today, God. And I ask that you help me to deliver it the way that it needs to be delivered. Let me speak with wisdom, love, compassion, and anointing and power. I ask you now to confirm your word. I declare healing today for the total man. I speak it in the name of Jesus Christ. I take authority and bind any spirit that would oppose or contradict the word of God. I bind you and I command you to go from this building now in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus name. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands as you're being seated. Give the Lord one more praise. Amen. Praise God. I was asked one time why I could preach with such confidence about the miraculous power of God. My answer to that person was, 
I think I have an idea of what day I'm living in. When you see the throne of God and those beings that were declaring, holy, 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 Lord God, which was and is and is to come. You have to understand with God, there is no was or to come. God lives in an ever-present now. So what was the angels proclaiming? What was those beings proclaiming? I think they were dealing with the fact of trying to get us to understand the way that God dealt with humanity, the revelations of God, past, present, and future. So with that in mind, <clears throat> the great revelator sees that throne, sees a book, begins to weep because no one was worthy to loose the seals and to open the book. So John said one of the elders told him, don't weep, don't weep. There's somebody worthy to approach the throne. And John said, I wanted to turn and see who it was. And standing in the midst of the throne was the lamb as it had been slain. Mm. As it had been slain. See, I am convinced that what he was is the law. I call it the three L's. The law, the lamb, and Lord. I'd still believe that the law of God is important. It's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But I have noticed that we have a lot of people that want to live in what he was. The only thing they know about him is rules, regulations, thou shall not. Amen. They get trapped there. I believe that all scripture is given by inspiration. I believe that the law and the principles of the law are fulfilled in Christ. So I refuse to get trapped because if that's where you live, then it is epitomized by the statement, who is worthy to approach the throne? That's where you live if all you know about living for God is the law. You never feel worthy enough to approach the throne. So we've got some that live under that, then we've got others that skip over and they get into his lordship. Everything to them is about the future. Everything to them is way out there. They're trying to figure out all the horsemen and the vials and the trumpets and amen. I mean, they're so future-minded. I mean, you know, they just... You know, I, I, I'm just going to tell you, ain't nobody got it figured out. I know some of you sitting out there, you think you got all the answers. I, you know, <laughs> he's going to come when he wants to come. He's going to do what he's going to do. Whether you got it figured out or not, he's going to do exactly what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And I see some people so focused on the millennial reign, the lordship of Jesus Christ. So they either live in the past or they live in the future. But the present, today, is the day of the slain lamb. The slain lamb, that's where we live. We don't live in what he was. We don't live yet in what he is to become. We live in the present tense day of the slain lamb. I've often wondered what it was that John seen when he turned. He said, I seen him, the lamb as it had been slain, standing the lamb as it had been slain. Now to me, in my simple way of viewing things, I see him the way that he looked at Calvary. I see him there standing with a gaping hole in his side. I see him with wounds in his hands. I see him with stripes upon his back. And I see him with a crown of thorns. If you remember our text today, it gives great description. 
I, I, I like preaching from Isaiah chapter 53. But man, when you get to it, you, if you're not moved with something about the price that he paid for us, praise God. That ought to move you. He didn't have to, but he did. You didn't deserve it, but he went ahead and did it. You didn't merit it, but he gave it. Somebody ought to praise him right now for that man that was acquainted with grief and sorrow. He talks about the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. I, uh, I've been in Pentecost all my life. I've been in some great, tremendous services. I've heard tremendous preaching, revelatory preaching. I've heard us talk about the merit of divine healing. I still believe in divine healing. Mm. I still believe in divine healing. <clears throat> I, uh, I thank God that we're still a part of people who believe in divine healing. I uh, mentioned something to Pastor Gentry a while ago. I said, you know what happens when the church has moved away from divine healing? No, sir. I said, they had to build hospitals. <laughs> yeah, I know. They had to build hospitals. That's why most of your hospitals are owned by some type of a denomination or a church group or a religious group. And I'm not opposed to hospitals. I, I, I thank God for them. I've been in them. I was in one this week. Thank God for it. Thank God for doctors. Thank God for nurses. Thank God for, you know, I mean, thank God for all of them. I mean, they, they truly have a ministry. I believe they have a ministry. I can remember when I was in recovery from getting my chest opened up and God gave me that little revelation. Those people were in there and uh, being so kind, making sure I was getting better. And uh, the Lord said, these people have a ministry. They minister to the physical body. It may not be divine, but they minister to the physical body. So I'm not here today preaching against hospitals or doctors. I've got some good ones, amen. Don't do what they say, but I've got some good ones. <laughs> and, uh, but I am telling you that we must never depend more on the arm of flesh than we do on the divine. Stay with me a second. Amen. I am convinced today that when they pierced his side and outflowed blood and water, I've always seen that as our atonement to redeem us. What is redeemed through Calvary? Well, at this point, your body is not redeemed. That's why you need help with it. But your spirit was redeemed. I thank the Lord for that. Paul wrote to the church at Rome in the eighth chapter and said, wherefore we cry, Abba, Father, to wit, you were redeemed. There's another redemption coming. That is the redemption of your body. Your body is not redeemed yet. It won't be redeemed until you're glorified. But Paul did say, to wit, the redemption of our bodies. That's also why, because Paul knew of the great struggle between a redeemed spirit, that divine nature, and the fact of you being uh, <clears throat> still in the natural man, the body. He knew the great battle between those two. That's why he uh, mentions there, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For when we know not what we should pray for as we ought, the Spirit itself maketh intercession. Infirmities deal with your frailties, your weaknesses, your battles, your struggles. Paul knew that in your flesh, in your human nature, there's a battle but yet the Spirit was given to you to help those infirmities, 
to break through for you. That's exactly what it means. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth. That means, the best way I can explain it, it means to punch through something. So when I can't punch through it, the Spirit helps me punch through it. It helpeth my infirmities, amen. I'm glad that my spirit was redeemed. I'm glad that as a boy of eight years old in southeast Missouri in a little country town called Kennett, Missouri, that on a cold October night in 1970, I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in tongues. I tell people that's when I got the Holy Ghost. But then I say, he didn't get me until I was about 16, almost 17, amen. But I'm thankful for the fact that we have a strong message to preach. My answer back is I can preach with conviction and confidence because we still live in the day of the slain lamb. So I can take a view of Calvary, see what happened at Calvary, and I can preach with conviction for the price that he paid. You may ask yourself the question today, I, would God really save me? Would God really fill me with his spirit? Well, I could try to show it to you in the scripture, but the best way for me to do it today is if I could take you to Calvary and let you watch that soldier as he pierced his side and out came blood and water to cleanse and to redeem you. Now, if you can see that and then walk away from there saying, I don't think he can do it. Well, you really got a problem, amen. Because the best thing that I can do today is preach the cross to you, bring you to Calvary, and let you see the price that he paid. He paid it for you, amen. You shouldn't have to be convinced of it. You just need a good view of Calvary. I'm afraid that we apostolics have moved away from the simplicity of the preaching of the cross. I'm telling you today, there is not a more powerful message in the world than the preaching of the cross. When we preach the cross, we preach the redemption of our spirits. We preach the new birth, and it comes from the cross. Oh, praise God. Anybody glad for the fact that God saved you? that his blood washed away your sins, that you were atoned. Praise God. Praise God. Some of you ought to be a little more excited than that. I already told you, you didn't deserve it, but he gave it to you. Woo. So there's one of the first views of the cross. I see the spirit being redeemed. I see the hole in his side, and I thank him for that. Then if I could take you to the back side of the cross, I'd show you stripes upon his back. Does God really want to heal me? Is it his purpose to heal me? I can't answer. I don't have all the answers for stuff. I don't know why people go through. I don't understand all that. I, 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 I just try to somehow find a simple answer to all this. I can't tell you today. I don't know that I would have a direct word for some of you. But I can tell you that if I could just get you to the cross, and if you could just see the backside of Calvary, if you could just see stripes placed upon his back, that alone ought to, that ought to move you. You ought to understand, he did that for me. Does he want to heal me? He did that for you. He didn't do it just so Mel Gibson could make a good movie out of it. He did it for your, for your body. He did it to heal you. I believe in divine healing. I believe there's not a disease or an affliction known to man that God cannot and will not heal you of. Woo! I need a little more. I need a little more affirmation. I, 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 I need to know how many of you really believe. And by his stripes, we are healed. By, somebody ought to be healed right now. 
I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care what the diagnosis of pride. I don't, whose report will you believe? And I, 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 I feel it right now. I, I, I feel it right now. I better be careful, Brother Morgan. You better be careful. I understand. I understand. I had a lot of faith. I believe God. God's going to heal my heart. Pastor Mangan, Bishop Mangan prayed for me. Others prayed for me. I was in a camp meeting. I was actually conducting district conference when the surgeon texted me and said, call my office. I need to schedule you from open heart surgery. Well, that's great news. Brother Dean was preaching in that service. He came over to me and said, I feel to pray for you. And they gathered around and prayed. I felt, I felt the witness of the Holy Ghost. I felt the power of God. I believe God to do it. I'm not making any excuses. I'm, tr I'm trying to show you something. I'm not making any excuses here today. I, I, I prayed. I've seen God do some tremendous things. I have personally seen three people raised from the dead. I've seen them come out of wheelchairs. I've seen them throw walkers. I mean, you know, I mean, I've seen God do some tremendous things. So it wasn't a question of whether or not, but I will not forget the day that God spoke this to me. Why is it that every mountain that comes into your life, you want to cast into the sea? Some mountains are not meant to cast into the sea. Some mountains are meant to climb. And this mountain in your life now is one I want you to climb. But trust me, when you get to the top, the view will be well worth it. Mm. And I'll tell you something else. That followed immediately with this. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Meaning, as long as God's doing everything you want him to do, you don't know true obedience. It's when he asks you to go down a path that you don't want to go down. It's where you learn obedience. Mm. All right, let me hear. I'm about, I'm, now, I believe in divine healing. We preach all that. I mean, I'm in an Acts 238 church here today. I, I mean, my God, this is what POA is all about, Acts 2.38. <laughs> Miracles. I mean, you guys cut your teeth on all that. But what is the forgotten message of Calvary? So when I look at it and I see hoe in his side, I see stripes on his back. But when's the last time you heard somebody mention a crown of thorns? Now, we preach divine healing, and we preach redemption of the Spirit. But what was for that crown of thorns? What was, what was it about the crown of thorns? Well, number one, you could look at it and say, well, you know, he told Pilate that I, I'm a king. My kingdom's not of this world. And so the Roman soldiers decided to mock him, plated him a crown of thorns, pressed it on his brow. But I got to looking at uh, the definition of crown of thorns this morning. And it dealt with uh, grief. It dealt with uh, sorrow. And then it uses a word that really got my attention, anxiety. So all of that is mentioned in the crown. Okay, you don't believe me? Go ahead, Google it right now, crown of thorns, look it up. When they press that crown of thorns down on his brow, that represented just as much as the hole in his side, redemption, just as much as stripes on his back, recognizes divine healing for the body. The crown of thorns was for the healing and the purifying of your mind. I looked at that this morning. 
Uh, Sister Mickey, I, I, I'm sorry I wasn't here Thursday. I got to visit one of y'all's wonderful hospitals here. And uh, I, 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 I'm sorry. And then I asked people, and of course, Bishop Mangan, he just, that's the best session of the whole thing, man. You got to get that. You got to listen. And I, I heard that it was on mental health. And, and I come into this service with a little conflict because, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm going to watch it. And so I don't know what you said, and I don't want to, I hope that we're in agreement. <laughs> but, you know, we talk a lot about, man, you know, your spirit, your body. But we, we shy away a lot from our minds. I can still remember standing in Manteca, California with, uh, with uh, a doctor, Dr. Wolf. And uh, I was uh, having a complete nervous breakdown. And uh, he diagnosed me with acute panic and anxiety disorder. And <clears throat> he, uh, matter of fact, 20 years ago, whatever it was, when I was preaching here, I was in the thick of it. And uh, I uh, still stood there and I uh, listened to him and, and I said, how, how? I mean, what? Well, to be honest with you, tell me what your schedule is. So I told him how busy I was, proud of it. Successful preacher. Traveling the world, living out of a suitcase, running, 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 running. He said, well, that's probably part of your problem. I said, what do you mean? He said, I mean, you're too young, you've gone too fast, too hard, and something's got to give somewhere. And he said, this is where your body and all has decided to shut down. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. That's not of God. You lying doctor. And then uh, we got ready to leave and he prescribes me all this medicine. Now, before I get into this, I, 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 if you take medicine for whatever, I, 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 I'm not preaching against it, so understand what I'm saying. So he prescribed all this medicine and so on, my wife said, doctor, I'm just gonna tell you right now, he's not gonna take it. I know him, he's not gonna take it. And uh, because in my mind, I'm like, this is not supposed to happen. This is a devil. We just got back from the Philippine crusade. So I was convinced that some devil had followed me from the Philippines. <laughs> and I've had him do that. And I was convinced it was because of what happened in the Philippines and the crusades and all that. So I spent most of my time rebuking it and praying against it and trying to cast it out. And uh, so this doctor's telling me all that and I'm sitting there listening to it and my wife said, he's not gonna take the medicine. So, and this is what the doctor said, oh yeah, he'll take it. This is bad enough, he'll take it. So I got home. I could tell you about days walking around in the yard for hours, hours. Begging God, I need a touch. I rebuke this. I command this to go. The spirit, I command you to go. And uh, so one day it did get, it got so bad. It got so bad. So I went out and I got the medicine. And I'm looking at it. And Naomi said, are you going to take it? And I said, I, I, I'm, I'm praying about it. I don't know. Now, this is me. I've been prophesied to that I would go through this. I've been prophesied that you'll go through a time of darkness. It'll be very dark. You will despair of life. You will pray to die. You will meet Satan himself in this time of darkness. And I did. I could tell you that if you ever meet Satan face to face, literally, that the greatest thing you will feel is an utter hopelessness because he's chained in it. He is a hopeless creature. And that's exactly where he'd like to trap you. Hopelessness. 
So I stood there and I had the medicine in my hand and I said, God, I'm asking you. Now I know my road and my route was different. I'm asking you, what should I do? Is this, is this okay? I'm asking you, what should I do? Do I take the medicine? And I'll never forget it standing there. They offered me something to ease my pain. They offered me something to dull the suffering. And I'm asking you, I want you to feel all of this. This is the road that I have chosen for you. I want you to feel it. Now, I know some of you, you know, they offer a couple. I know some of you say, well, later on, you know, he drank from the other. Well, the first thing that they offered him was something to numb him, to put him to sleep, study it. The second thing was wine from the soldiers. It was a soured wine. It was to actually to replenish. And so he's saying, I'm not going to do anything that dulls this because I need to go through it. Why did he need to go through it? Woo. He was wounded for your transgressions. When he's suffering, he said, I could dull this, but I'm not going to because I need to feel everything that they're going to feel. I'm not going to do it. Mm. So I fleshed it down the toilet and chose to go a different route. I'll never forget when Sister Chenault called me. Son, you, you got to learn something. She said, the only thing that you know about prayer is spiritual warfare. You're always in a slugfest. You're always battling something. The only thing you know about prayer, just come on, devil, let's duke it out here. She said, but God's getting ready to teach you a completely different avenue of prayer. And she said, and you are about to learn how to let the word work. She says, so from now on, you're not going to go into spiritual warfare. You're going to sit and read the word of God and learn how to let the word work. Now, here's the deal. When all this emotional stuff's going on, the first thing you've got to remember is you cannot trust your emotions. They'll lie to you. They'll tell you one thing when the word is telling you something completely different. Uh-oh. So, you know, you can rebuke and cast out and do all that stuff. She said, that's only irritating, agitating. And she said, now, when you start down this road, you're going to feel backslid. It's because you're used to this other avenue. And, and I did. But I can also tell you for weeks, months, and even years, I'd sit at my kitchen table in the mornings for two or three hours, wasn't looking for a sermon. Ooh. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I, I, learning to let the word work. I can't trust how I feel, but I can trust this. I can trust this. I stood there one day at the kitchen. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm going too far. I stood there one day at the kitchen sink and I was convinced this is never going to end. I'll never come out of this. I will never come out of this. And I was um, getting a drink of water and uh, it was so weird because anything you went to do, panic would hit you. And I'd get to drink of water and oh my God, I'm going to choke on this water. I'm going to choke to death on this water. And it's just weird stuff. And so I was uh, sitting there with that glass in my hand, the Holy Ghost said, how many ounces will this cup hold? I, I don't know. Six, eight. This cup is designed to only hold so many ounces. Okay. I'm going to offer you a cup of suffering. This is what I offer anybody that has a position in my kingdom. You're going to drink the cup with me. But I want you to understand that this cup is not refillable. I have measured the amount of suffering you need in your life to get you to where I need you to be in the kingdom. I don't want you to drink half of it. I don't want you to get down to the bitter dregs and stop because if you do, you will become bitter. I can still remember standing in a Jiffy Lube reading a magazine 
and it was about the new way of wine and making wine in the old way and the wine presses. And I, I still remember sitting there reading this and it talked about in the old wine presses that only put just enough weight on the grape to crush the skin and to extract out of it its juices. If you put too much weight on it, it crushed the seed and the wine would be bitter. Sitting there reading that and the Holy Ghost said, I don't want to crush your spirit. If I crush your spirit, you'll become bitter. I'm only putting enough of this on you so I could break your will. All right, Lord. All right, Lord. Woo. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. So, okay, God, I'm, I'm gonna lean on that. Sister Vesta Mangan, you were preaching in Modesto. And I went, I was sitting there, you was preaching your usual fiery way. And you turned around, and you said, Brother Mark, I got a word for you. The cup of wrath you will drink no more. The cup of trembling you will drink no more. And you gave me a verse. I went home and looked at it. And the cup of trembling I will take out of your hand and you will drink it no more. And I'll give you power to walk over your enemies. God knows the certain amount of suffering. He knows the certain, see we don't like that word in North America. And the fellowship of his suffering is pretty limited group. Not a lot of people there. We want the power of his resurrection, but we don't like the fellowship of his suffering. I hope I'm not being too heavy here today. We, we don't like that. We want to shy away from that, especially North Americans. We think everything about living for God is just supposed to be, you know, happy-go-lucky and all that stuff and all. I'm telling you, if you ever, if you ever get anywhere with God in his kingdom, you cannot escape going through things and suffering things. It, it can be, listen, Job gives you a perfect example Three things Job was attacked in his health, his wealth, and his family. And if you think you're exempt from that, you're crazy. It may only be one area, it may be two, or it may be three. But you're not going to escape it because the devil and God's going to have the same conversation about you. Do you think they serve you for naught? The only reason why they serve you is because of everything you do for them. And God said, well, let's find out. Take it from them and see what they'll do. I got some pretty strong trust and confidence in old Job. And Job said, yet though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. I've been through hell and back. I've suffered in finances and health and family. Woo! And the Lord giveth and he taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. It does happen. It does happen. It does. can happen to you. My poor old mother-in-law struggled with stuff for years. I tell my wife, oh, man, she just doing that. <laughs> she just needs to, you know, toughen up a little bit. And then it hit me. Mm. Boy. Mm. Maybe she's not so kooky after all. <laughs> God gave me a little something to write, and I'm, I'm getting ready to wrap it up here. God gave me a little something to write. It's a little booklet, and I had. I call it the night season. I talk about where the psalmist said, and in the night season, thou hearest me not. Everybody has to go through, not just a night, but a night season. And uh, so I, I can remember, I think the first part of the little booklet, it's like seven, eight pages. It's not like some profound scholarly deal, just a testimony. I start out by where did the sun go? 
The Bible says when Jesus is on the cross, the sun hit its face. So one moment, life's great, plenty of sunshine, everything's wonderful. And then all of a sudden, the sun's gone. You're plunged into darkness. Where did the sun go? But then I tell a story about deer hunting. Now, I'm not a good deer hunter. I just go mainly for the fellowship. I don't like cleaning them. I just like shooting them and letting somebody that's hunting with us take care of everything else from that. I like shooting them, and the next time I see that deer is when it shows up on my doorsteps. <laughs> processed. <laughs> and uh, so I remember I was in Oklahoma, and man, I was, I, I, I didn't have a tree stand. I just, I, I just climbed up in this tree. And I was sitting there, and man, it was cold, a little freezing rain. I was stupid for do, doing what I was doing, but anyway, I was sitting there. And I, I, I looked down there, and it was, you know, Number one, I don't like going off into the woods in the dark. <laughs> I'm not afraid of the dark. I'm just a little worried about things that are in the dark. <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, I was sitting there, you know, and just I looked down to, in that little lane field and I seen it. And I thought, oh my God, there he is. I'm looking, and I, it's too dark to tell what it really is. And so, you know, and I've hunted with some guys. He just shot it anyway. <laughs> so I keep looking down through there, watching it. The sun's gradually coming up, gradually coming up. And uh, <laughs> I uh, keep looking. I'm looking through the scope. Man, I think that thing is a nice-sized buck but it's not moving. <laughs> and so I'm watching it. The sun keeps coming up a little bit, and finally there's enough light for me to tell what it was. It was a bush. <laughs> I was getting ready to shoot a bush. <laughs> That's a little hard to eat right there now. And uh, so in that little booklet, I put that in there. Where the apostle said, we have a, sure, a more sure word of prophecy until the day star arrives in our hearts. The day star is the full strength noonday sun. And so God began to deal with me through this night season. I want you to take my word that you have. It's a sure word. And I want you to hold on to it. And you'll come out of this like the sun coming up. And another thing he told me is, just like it was good you didn't shoot that bush, don't make any decisions in the twilight. You're not, you're not ready to do it. So I'm standing here today. So the other night, praying, okay, God, this has been quite a journey here. Where am I at? And uh, Brother Buster walked over to me, and he said, I, I just really feel to tell you something. I said, what? He said, that anxiety? Mm -hmm. So the Lord said, he's given you dominion. You're going to walk out of it. Now, <clears throat> you have to use God's authority, which is his word, when you're battling against these things. So there comes a point, though, that you use God's authority until finally he lets you put it under your feet. And the deal is, is a few weeks ago, a few months ago, you would be shocked now at the phone calls I get. Brother Morgan, or emails, or messenger. Brother Morgan, my husband, my wife, myself, pastors, a lot of pastors. I'm really going through a tough emotional deal here. We've heard your testimony a little bit, and can you just kind of help us? And uh, I share with them some stuff. So the other day, a lady called. She said, Brother Morgan, my daughter, it's really bad. And she said, you know, she watches you a lot on YouTube, and we've heard your testimony. Would you please pray? Now, I'll just be honest with you. Before all that happened, I would have prayed but it wouldn't have been with compassion. 
I'm going to tell you something in the Holy Ghost. Miracles are not going to come in the end time through faith. We apostolics, it's all about faith, 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 faith. But the Bible says that love worketh faith. And it also says that when Jesus was moved with compassion, he healed them. If you study it, he healed them. I mean, he had lunatics. I looked at that, it means vexed. I mean, they're distraught. It's emotional, all this stuff and all. And he called them lunatics. And then here's the disciples and Jesus, and they couldn't cast it out. And Jesus cast it out. And the Syrophoenician woman come to Jesus, my daughter's grievously vexed with the devil. Vexed. And that's what happens a lot of times because there's a soul conflict. Your soul's in conflict with something, so it begins to vex you. And then it starts to affect you emotionally. It starts to affect your mind. Is this too much like Dr. Phil right now? <laughs> it's what happens. But that crown of thorns, it also represented the authority of a king. It was mockery. So this morning, I said, I want you to look at this. They did put that crown of thorns on my head. And it is for the healing. But that means, in my own way, I was showing them that I had authority over all the total man, spirit, soul, and body. May the God of peace sanctify you wholly, spirit, soul, and body. I think that's the progress. It starts in your spirit. You got to get your spirit healthy. Yes. That's where it all starts. And so the deal is, is I looked at that and he said, why is it that you believe? And, and I, I still remember Dr. Wolf making this statement. I'm, I'm about done. Dr. Wolf making this statement. He said, look, you, you, you Pentecostals, what he said, you Pentecostals are funny people. Yeah. <laughs> he said, why is it if I prescribe something from here down, you'll take it? Your head's not connected to your body? <laughs> I was like, oh. I was in revival with Brother Haney in Stockton. And so, I mean, I missed several weeks. I thought the revival would end, but no, 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 no. I mean, he, you, you get back in the pulpit, you know. So I told him what the doctor said. He said, it's true. I agree with that. He said, but here's the thing. Your soul and your spirit are so intertwined that one affects the other, vice versa. And he said, Just, you got to start here with the spirit. And so <clears throat> I'm standing here today telling you that uh, now, God's going to heal you today. Yes, God's going to heal you today. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Man, I don't know what your discussion was and all, but I, so I, I did ask, I said, what was that? Well, it's about awareness of it. We need to, be, you know, so it, it does happen. And don't bury your literal head in the sand here and say it won't happen to me. We're ne we've never fought so much fear. It's just rampant. So, so here's the deal. I, I, I don't know what journey you're on, but I, I, I felt in prayer this morning this one thing. I was in revival in Oak Mogi with Sam Emery, and he was preaching, and he turned, and he went down the center aisle. The place was packed. I mean, we had visitors. We had folding chairs out. I mean, down the center aisle, across the front. The back doors were open. We had people stuck in the foyer. And he starts down the center aisle. And when he did, I'm watching him preach, you know, typical Sam Emery preaching. And all of a sudden, I see next to him this light, and it just twirls. I was like, whoa. And what in the world and the Lord spoke and said, I have sent my angel deliverance into this building. And so I'm watching it happen. Sam turns, and when he starts coming back up the aisle, this light's falling behind him. And as he would pass by the chairs, these people just start falling out. I mean, come down a little ways up the center aisle, then they come across the front. I mean, these are visitors. These are people, and I mean, as it went by them, it just... Hey, I love Kusha, Maya. It just, it's just falling out. And I'm like, Maya. Now, I took that so literal that I changed the name of the church from the United Pentecost Church of Oak Mogi to Deliverance Tabernacle. 
I can tell you story after story after story of people walking into that building, even when we weren't having church, and they'd say, oh, what was that? What? I just seen something. Okay, what was it? I don't know. It's just like I just seen a light and just kind of, and my God, look, you know, skin's crawling and all this stuff and all. I said, yeah, 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 you, you did. You seen something. Had a man laying carpet for us. Was getting ready to have our Easter service. We was trying to get the carpet done. We just remodeled the building. And he, man, this guy's messed up. I mean, he'd been in prison, took the rap for somebody. I mean, he was, he was a deal. And I just prayed his sister and brother-in-law through the Holy Ghost. So he was doing some work for us. And so on that Saturday night, I went back over to see if he was done. And he, he said, okay, I want to know something. I said, what? He said, I want to know what's in this building. Now, I know some of you are very practical and analytical, and this is kind of weird for some of you. But does not the Bible say that they are sent forth to minister? Yeah. Woo. So I told him, I said, well, Danny, this is, you know, he's, I, I, I'm not coming back. I'm glad this job's done. This is spooky. He said, I don't want nothing to do with this and all. And I said, well, you need to come to church tomorrow. He said, I, I ain't come to church. He said, I'm too bad. I'm too messed up. Got too much stuff. I said, just come on to church. So sure enough, the next day was about midway through the service. It was a good service. And he, he come in, sat in the back. And then uh, next thing I know, he's, <laughs> he just screams out. And he comes running toward the front, sliding in the altar. And after church, I said, what happened? He said, you know what happened. <laughs> Whatever that thing is, it touched me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I was preaching when I was a young evangelist. We had a guy, he just drove his wife to church, man. He hated us. He just drove her to church, you know, just come make fun, pick us pieces. And I said something that night about, I sensed the angel of the Lord in this building and, and he leaned off to his wife. He said, that's crazy. I don't believe none of that stuff. So a few seconds went by and he said he felt something kind of grab his shoulder. So he turned to look and thought it was his wife. She had leaned down, talking to the lady down the pew from her. So he just shook it off. He said, then it gripped me a little stronger. Some of you might want to be very careful when you start saying, I don't believe in all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Gripped him a little stronger. He shook it off. He said, I must be crazy. <laughs> Third time. It gripped him, and then it got in his ear and said, I am an angel of the Lord sent to you this night. You've never heard a man scream like that in your life. I mean, when he let that scream out, <laughs> we all, he running down the aisle. He hits the altar. He, he hits the altar. He looks up at the pastor. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I hated you. I hated this church. I'm sorry. He looked at me and said, I really hated you. <laughs> he said, but this is real. It's got to be real. And I mean, it was just a few seconds. That old boy's laying flat on his back talking in tongues and all that stuff. Now, I'm going to tell you what I feel. I'm going to tell you what I feel. There's a reason why that God's bringing our attention to this stuff. But I asked him this morning, just as much as he allowed an angel deliverance to abide in that building in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. I ask him to let an angel abide in this building for the healing of your minds and that people would come and be emotionally healed. I'm talking by the power of God. Woo! I invoke the name of Jesus right now. I call upon the king to issue the decree. In the name of Jesus. Woo. Mm. All right. All right. All right. I believe he's here. Now, we're going to take care. Of, now, look, it's, it's 20 till, and I know, and we're going to do this real fast. We don't have to have it. Man, I used to have prayer lines. I mean, line them up. They wear you out. So we're not going to do that. So in just a minute, I, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say, 
If you need a healing for your spirit, for your body, or for your mind, I'm going to invite you to come to the front. Just in a minute. And then when we get up here, the Bible says one thing. The Syrophoenician woman, my daughter's grievous to vex the devil, and Jesus said, it's not appropriate for me to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. The first thing that you've got to understand that what we're talking about, the miraculous, is not something that you have to beg for. If you have a real father and you were a child, you did not have to go into his bedroom every morning at 6 o'clock, fall across the foot of the bed and say, will you please get up and go to work so you can feed us? The scripture is very clear. I feel a spiritual challenge right now. The, spirit, the scripture is very clear. Earthly fathers being evil know how to give good gifts. How much more is your heavenly father to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Then he says, a man that does not provide for his own household is worse than an infidel, and he's denied the faith. Now, if he is your heavenly father, he's not expecting me as an earthly father to do something that he's not bound to himself. And just as easy it is for me to provide for my kids and give them the bread and clothing and things that they need, your heavenly father has a whole lot more of that in him. So when you start looking at the miraculous, it is not something that you have to go to your heavenly father and beg him for. He said, it's the children's bread. I just want to give it to you. Woo. So we're not going to come up here and beg today. I don't care how many times you've been up here being prayed for. I'm telling you, people, I believe we'll get the Holy Ghost in just a second. I believe that there'll be people physically healed. I think there's been a spirit of affliction attack this church and physical things. I bind that nasty devil in the name of Jesus Christ. My God can heal you of any disease. I don't care what it is. I don't care what the report was this past week. I don't care what everybody around you is saying. I'm telling you right now, they beat his back for the healing of your body. Woo. So we're just going to ask him. And once you ask him, just be specific with him. I'm asking you to heal. I'm asking you to fill me with the Holy Ghost. I'm asking you to redeem me. I'm asking you to heal my mind. Demons take advantage of people that are having emotional, mental problems. Mm. So sometimes before you can get deliverance, your mind's got to get healed. Until your mind gets healed, you keep opening the door for all that other stuff. So, you ready? All right, here we go. It's too simple. He already done it at Calvary. We don't have to complicate it. You can't add anything to Calvary. It's already done. Woo. So I want you to see him. I want you to see the lamb slain. All right, you ready? Now, if you need a healing for spirit, your body or your mind, your emotions, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this. I want you to look at the hundreds of people that are coming. Ooh. Your heavenly father today is being moved with compassion towards you. He sees us as sheep scattered without a shepherd. He knows the plight of humanity. He knows your battles, your struggles right now. He knows the torment. He knows the anxiety. He knows all of that. The other day the Lord woke me up and said, before you can see my arm and my hand, you have to get my ear. And you have not because you ask not. So it's going to be real simple. Nothing mystical. Nothing sensational. I just believe 
that the love of God is going to be manifested towards you today. And that God sees your situation and the Spirit is about to help your infirmities. Woo. If you've never received the Holy Ghost, then I just encourage you to repent. Ask God to cleanse you, wash you, forgive you. And then lift your hands and ask him for it. Just ask him for the Holy Ghost. If you do it according to the Bible, in about a few seconds, you'll be talking in tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. If you need a physical healing, quote that to him. Lord, I quote to you your word. Your word says, by your stripes I am healed. And I want you to go look at his back and just stand there and look at it and then say, I ask for that to be applied to my life today. Woo. The chastisement of my peace, my peace of mind was upon him. Amen. Are we ready? I feel a witness of the Holy Ghost right now. I feel a mass healing coming to this building right now. Now, Lord, I've preached your word. I've said everything that I felt like you told me to say that you gave me in my spirit. I can't do anything except have faith and believe and trust in what you told me. So I'm now asking you, according to your word, I want you to fulfill it. I want you to confirm it. We are standing upon Isaiah chapter 53. All of that you did for us. So I'm asking you right now to release into this building. First of all, I ask you that the gift of faith will come into this building right now. Mm. We covet the gift of faith to come into this building right now. Let us have some of your faith to believe now. Woo! Meet the deficit of our faith by the gift of faith. Now, according to your word, God, I ask you in the name of Jesus to release healing of the total man into this building right now. Body, soul, and spirit in the name of Jesus. Now, ask him for it. Ask him for it. Ask him for it. Be specific. Ask him for it. And then lift your hands and begin to thank him and say, according to your word, I believe it is done. You need the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost right now in the name of Jesus. If you need a physical healing, I pray the gifts of healing and the working of miracles will happen as we stand here right now in the name of Jesus. Woo! If you need an emotional healing, I pray right now that crown of thorns that crown of thorns, you'd see it and know that he was wounded. He was chastised for all of this. I stand today asking and proclaiming that you are the healer of my mind. Woo! Let that light come back into my life. Let the zest of life start coming back. Let me start coming out of this darkness. Let your word be a light and a lamp to my feet. I speak it today in the name of Jesus. Woo! In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just believe him when you ask. Just trust him when you ask. He is your heavenly father. I'm asking the angel of the Lord to start moving through this altar right now. The angel of the Lord that trouble the waters of healing, I'm asking them to trouble it here today. Just plunge into it right now. Something's being troubled, I'm going into it right now. In the name of Jesus. you to do one more thing I'm going to ask you to find somebody close to you listen and I want you to pray for them with compassion I, they're struggling they're battling they're standing here it's either a spiritual physical or an emotional deal here's what I want to ask you to do Lord whatever gift of the spirit is needed 
for me to effectively minister to this brother or sister. I'm asking you to let it operate in my life in the name of Jesus. And then I just want you to turn and pray for them. Pray with faith, believing that God's going to use you in the gift of the Spirit right now. That's it. Go on. Go on. That person that you're starting to pray for may have just had a complete breakdown. That person that you're praying for right now may have just been wounded. Woo! This is the power of his body. This is the power of his body. Love one another. Love one another. That's it. Let it flow. God's using some of you right now. There's healing flowing through you. The gifts of healing are flowing through you right now. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, that the ministering spirit that is here in this building right now, it's not just contained to these four walls. It can meet you right where you are, what you are facing and going through mentally, physically, emotionally, mind, body, spirit. It can meet you. And I pray the ministering spirit, the ministering angels that have met us here will meet you wherever you are, in your car, in your home, wherever you may be, that God meets you right now in the name of Jesus. He's able to heal you, touch you, restore you, bless you, believe in him. I don't know if he's doing it right this second. I don't know if it's a process, but what I do know is the ministering spirit of Almighty God and angels are coming to you right now. I pray that over you. I speak that over you. Be healed, set free, delivered, renewed, restored by the power of the name of Jesus. And with his stripes, I claim it for you today. You're healed in Jesus' name. It's been an honor to have you. Thank you for being with us. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday night at 7 and next Sunday at 10. Let the ministering Spirit of God touch you right now in Jesus' name. God bless you.